right off the bat, I want to say I'm not making any jokes about anybody's wife's hair. So, so I don't want anybody charging the podium here. So that won't happen. Uh, glad to have everybody back. Uh, my lovely wife, Paulette's here. Hello, Paulette. And my buddy George can't make it this week, but Mary's here, his wife. So glad to see Mary. George is on the mend, but he'll be back. He'll be back soon. Um, welcome to my loyal cousins, Bernie, Penny, and Nat. Over there. They're here to maybe protect me if it gets rough. <laughs> also, thanks so much to the Legion, which has been uh, the perfect venue for what we do over all these years. Thanks to Sharon Grubb for all she does. Uh, also, thanks to the great servers we have here, and uh, be generous with them. Thanks always to Cats TV. Uh, they're recording all our programs. It's a very big deal. Uh, they're helping us prever preserve our uh, rich local history. Uh, we have any first-time attendees? First time? If you want to be on our on our regular mailing list, it's an email list. You can leave your email address with me. If you're on Facebook, you might not need it because I, I put it all on there. But uh, if, you, if you want to be on that list, just leave that with me. Let's see here. Well, first, uh, Daniel Schlegel of the History Center would like to make a few comments. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're very excited to be here. Um, so we are very much looking forward to this with Hillary from the History Center coming today. So I'll keep my announcements really brief. As usual, I have all kinds of interesting books and everything over here. So please feel free to stop by and see me over there. And then we also have a free event tonight. So if you are not tired of seeing my smiling face today, you can come this evening and we have a, a free event open to open to the public. It's Remarkable Women. So we have Dr. Gladys Devane, who if anyone came to our Black Author Speaks event this past July, she read some of the poetry and some of the other readings from this her recently published book. At the time, it was yet to be published, but it has since been published. Um, so we have her doing a reading with Charlie Nelms as the MC tonight, and then Liz Mitchell will be putting on a one-woman play about, um, uh -oh. thank you, Maddie Jacobs Fuller, had a brain fart for a moment, uh, but, but it, is, it will be a, a, an excellent performance tonight. It is free, it is open to the public. I did bring some more cards, so feel free to come over and see me and pick up a card as a reminder. Uh, it's at 6 p.m., so we hope to see you there. And as usual, if you have not been to the History Center recently, Please feel free, feel free to come by and see us. We have some great exhibits up, and we're always happy to see you out there. So come by and visit us anytime. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. Just going to go over some of the coming events here. We're scheduled almost a year ahead, which uh, is good. The next one is April 26th, Dr. Jim. Madison, uh, Professor Emeritus at IU, is going to give a program on the Ku Klux Klan in the Heartland. He's written a book, which was a, a pretty big seller, uh, and that's what, that's what this entails. May 31st, John Baton, also an IU professor, uh, will give a program called Reconstructing Bloomington. What would it have looked like walking through Bloomington in 1907? Uh, he used Sanborn fire maps. Uh, they're utilized to give an idea of what old Bloomington actually looked like back then. June 28th, uh, another IU professor, Jim Capshu, will give a program on the life and time of Herman B. Wells, and he's written a book on that as well. Uh, July 26th, Derek Ritchie, who's spoken here many times, will give a program on the Laberto and Hunter mansions, which are long gone. August 30th, John Summerlot, another IU professor, <laughs> will give a program called Arbutus Mania, which I didn't know what he was talking about when he mentioned it to me. But uh, it swept Bloomington and IU in the early 1900s, uh, spawning the yearbook uh, that came along, among other things. September 27th, Brad Cook of IU Photo Archives, who's been here before too, will show some vintage 
photos of Bloomington, and he's got thousands of them. October 25th, Hillary Fleck, who's here today, will return uh, to show highlights from the Herald Times archive photo collection. They turned all, over all their photo negatives to the History Center, and they're in the process of scanning them, and she'll show a lot of them. We've done that before, mainly with the 50s and 60s. This goes a little bit farther out, 70s on up, I think. Uh, November 29th, March Faber will give a history on the local post offices in town. Uh, December 27th, Clay Stuckey, our friend Clay over there, will give a program called Bits, Pieces, and Curiosities of Monroe County Railroads. And then lastly, on January 31st, 2023, Al Parker, a wildlife biologist, will give a program on the history of the bald eagle reintroduction to Lake Monroe, something I don't know anything about, so that should be interesting. Now, to today's program. March is Women's History Month. And uh, appropriately, Hillary Fleck, the collections manager at the Monroe County History Center, has agreed to give a presentation for us on the contributions of women locally in our history. Specifically, we thought that the advancement of women in local politics over the years was a very important topic. This covers the time all the way back to 1914 up to present day. There is no regard or preference to specific parties here, but only a shout out to what those who came before did to contribute to our county in public service. It is in no way an ex exercise in current events. So let's appreciate and salute the accomplishments of these women in our history, regardless of party affiliation. Uh, the name of the program is The History of Women in Politics in Monroe County, and here's Hillary. Michael, and thank you to the History Club and the American Legion for hosting me today. It's always a joy to talk to you all and share some local history to, for, to uh, a very enthusiastic group. Like this? Okay. Got it. Got it. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> I'd also like to thank the Monroe County Clerk's Office uh, for their resources and flexibility in working with uh, the election records, which um, from all of this information stems from. Uh, which I'm going to talk more about in just a minute. Okay, so first I wanted to take a moment at the beginning of my presentation to add a disclaimer regarding political affiliation. I began this project in 2020 with the intention to honor the women from our community who have served Monroe County at the local, state, and national level. It is not my intention to focus on their political affiliation, but rather time and service to Monroe County. If I mention a political party, it is because it is necessary to give accurate information or important to their election. I will take time to mention events, policies, or laws that were passed during a women's term to give historical context. There is no intention to show political preference or affiliation. My goal is to celebrate their service, not their party. I will be answering questions and taking comments at the end of the presentation, and I ask that you also respect the women's service to our community. So thank you. Uh, the research for this presentation was conducted in 2020 and 2021 as a branch off of the previous suffrage research. In 2020, the History Center had a Votes for Women exhibit to celebrate the local women who fought for equal suffrage. The exhibit ended in 1920 with the passage of the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. To follow up on the suffrage exhibit in 2021, the History Center displayed See Her Run, Monroe County Women in Politics exhibit to continue the story of local women involved in and engaged with politics. The source of this research was a set of nine election record books housed at the Monroe County Clerk's Election Central Office. We partnered with the Clerk's Office to digitize and index the records, which are available at our research library at the Monroe County History Center. This is the first page of election book zero, the results of the election in 1890, laid out by township on the left side here, and then uh, the candidate across, the candidate and the position across the top of the page. Uh, our amazing volunteers and student interns were tasked with scanning each page of the nine election books and indexing the information into a spreadsheet. 
And they were able to turn this information into this. Our indexes are organized by year as well as by surname to help with genealogical research. Additionally, we have put the indexes online so you can go onto our website and look through them as you like. So looking through this information, we can understand so much about local political activity, trends, tight races, popularity of political parties, and voter distribution in precincts. The focus of my research, however, was the local women who appeared in these records. So who was the first woman to appear in the election records? Helen Gauger. Uh, Helen was a lawyer, journalist, and a temperance and women's rights advocate from Lafayette, Indiana. She ran in 1896 for the Attorney General, but was unsuccessful. Uh, Helen was a very, has led a very interesting life, but she was not from Monroe County. The election records indicate that after Helen's bid in 1896, five additional women, non-local women, uh, ran for state offices, but the first Monroe County woman to run for office was Maud Luzatter. Uh, Maud ran for county coroner in 1914. Maud was involved in the local suffrage group, the Women's Franchise League of Bloomington, and served as the organization's vice president in 1916. Her husband was Dr. John Luzatter, and it seems that it would have been a very convenient relationship for a doctor to be married to the coroner. Uh, after some cursory research, it was quite difficult to uncover the re requirements uh, for the position of coroner in 1914. Um, so that's still unclear, but uh, other than being married to the local doctor, Maud seemed to have no medical training at all that I could uncover. Uh, but that didn't, doesn't restrict her from the possibility of learning from her husband. It just is an interesting relationship that we can't really figure out at this time. Um, and as you can see here, Maud uh, was part of the, this is very difficult to read at this level, uh, but Maude was part of the Prohibition Party, and she received 51 votes. Um, she was not, the, uh, these two, Maude and George, were not the only two candidates. There are three other candidates on the other page. Um, so, um, However, Maude was not the only local woman to appear in the records that year. Sarah Oldham w also uh, ran in 1914, uh, but she ran for the Office of County Recorder. Sarah and her husband, George, lived in Smithville. And I don't know, I can't tell if Sarah was involved in the lo local suffrage activity as her name doesn't appear in any surviving newspapers of the time. However, I think it's safe to say that Sarah and Maude were very brave and opened themselves up to ridicule and adding their names to the ballot when they themselves could not even vote for themselves. Um, so you can see Sarah, here it is. Sarah is here. She's also part of the Prohibition Party she received 43 votes. The next local female candidate was Layla Smith, who ran for sheriff in 1928. So 18, eight years after the passing of the 19th Amendment, and women can now vote in all elections. Her campaign was unsuccessful, but I was able to find a few mentions of her candidacy in newspapers of the time, such as this clipping from the journal and Courier. Um, it says, Bloomington woman seeks sheriff's job. Bloomington, Indiana, March 27th, for the first time in the history of Monroe County, a woman is a candidate for the office of sheriff. Miss Layla Smith is the adventurous female who has announced that she will seek the Republican nomination for that office. I will fill the office personally, Miss Smith said. For a number of years, Miss Smith has been a successful paper hanger. <coughs> A couple of interesting points to note on the clipping. It says, Layla, I will fill the office personally, indicating that perhaps this is a comment on the current sheriff uh, possibly being negligent in his duties. Um, and then following for a number of years, Ms. Smith has been a successful paper hanger. Uh, a paper hanger in 1928 was an interior decorator. So this is emphasized actually in the next clipping about her candidacy in the same newspaper only the following day. Layla Smith is running for sheriff in, in Monroe County. Layla says she intends to fill the office in person. Layla is a paper hanger. If any um, um, braggiest 
a prisoner gets snooty with Sheriff Layla, she'll paste him one, adorn him with an OG, and, and put a dado around him. <laughs> so, this clipping takes a drastically different tone to announcing her candidacy, candidacy than Wednesday's announcement, which was a sort of associated press kind of announcement. This cl clipping is disrespectful of Layla as it mocks and mocks her profession. Repeatedly calling her Layla instead of Miss Smith is disrespectful, as she was about 40 years old at this time and uh, of her candidacy and not a child. And paste him one, adorn him with an OG, and put a dado around him are all references uh, to her job of interior decorating and therefore mocking her profession and desire for public service. I'm using this clipping as an example of the public opinion that many early female candidates opened themselves up to by running for political office. Another notable early female candidate was Miss Alice Palmer in 1934 for the office of mayor of Bloomington. Uh, it's difficult to see the clipping, but it says Bloomington, Indiana, April 18th, adopting the golden rule as her platform, Mrs. Alice Palmer, operator of the Bloomington Massage Salon, is waging a spirited campaign for the Republican nomination for mayor of Bloomington. She is the only woman seeking the nomination and is opposed by four prominent men. Alice Palmer was a physiotherapist who owned the Bloomington Massage Salon on East 6th Street. Newspaper reports indicate that Ms. Palmer's friends and business acquaintances encouraged her to run for office. In her candidacy announcement, she declared the golden rule uh, to be her platform, which I, it's never really explained what that means, but I'm guessing it means treating others as you want to be treated. I'm not really sure because she never actually says what the golden rule means. Uh, but Mrs. Cam Palmer's candidacy did not survive the primary elections. Um, however, she was not the only woman to run for office in 1934. Miss Mary Vanna Thrasher was the first successful female candidate for public office. Yay! <laughs> and she was elected to Bloomington Clerk Treasurer in 1934. Uh, the clipping reads, Bloomington, Indiana, November 12th. Miss Vanna Thrasher of this city is the first woman ever elected to public office in Monroe County. She defeated her male opponent, the Democratic nominee, for city clerk treasurer by a majority of 1,070 votes in the city election on Tuesday. Fourteen years after gaining women's suffrage, the first woman was elected to office in Monroe County. She was re-elected in 1938. And then, unfortunately, a scandal occurred when it was discovered that Vanna had paid a city contractor from an incorrect bond. Ms. Thrasher was sued by the state of Indiana and eventually settled out of court. But the damage had been done, and Vanna never served public office again. Our next successful candidate was Mrs. Frances Presley in 1936. The clipping reads, Mrs. Frances Presley is Monroe County's first woman to hold an, a, an elected public office. She will become county treasurer January 1st and was elected on the Democratic ticket. The clipping is both correct and incorrect. Frances Presley was the first woman to be elected to a countywide office, but not the first woman in Monroe County to hold an office. That title belongs to, we just talked about, Vanna Thrasher. So either the press has a really short memory or somebody is very confused. Frances had served several years as deputy treasurer um, and uh, Mrs. Presley had graduated from Ellisville High School. She was unfortunately not reelected in 1938, but she nevertheless continued to work in government in the Indiana Gross Income Tax Division until she retired to Las Vegas, Nevada. Mary P. Homestead was the first woman um, to be elected to the Bloomington City Council in 1942. Uh, as one of two women elected to city office at that time, the other one being uh, Vanna Thrasher, uh, Mary understood the need for more female voices in government. Councilwoman Hol Homestead attended the state conference of the Indiana Municipal League and introduced to that body a resolution to endorse appointing more women to city boards and commissions. The resolution was defeated, but Mary was not. She spread her mes message through the newspapers and worked to make change however she could. This is one of the uh, articles that she submitted to the newspaper. 
women uh, says women's part in politics. Women have a real grievance in the political setup of this state and country. County, sorry. Uh, Mrs. Mary P. Holmstead of Bloomington, as a delegate to the recent convention of the Indiana Municipal League, introduced a resolution urging the appointment of more women to city boards and commissions. Her resolution was sidetracked. There is no doubt that women are entitled to a larger part than they play in the affairs of government. They cast practically one half of the ballot at elections. They cast, oh, I just read that. They are one half the population and should figure more prominently in management of cities and other political units. Eventually they will and should get more recognition, but not until they get, uh, get busy on their own behalf. The failure of women to have a greater part in politics has been due to their own indifference. Really. Comparatively, uh, few among them have taken, active, taken an active hand in party affairs, and still fewer have sought office. If the time comes when half of the members elected to legislators, legislatures, city councils, and county boards, and other offices are women, they will get their full quota of appointments to city boards and commissions. They are making progress, even if slowly. Women as voters may be comparatively newcomers, but they are here to stay. Not only should they be encouraged to share political responsibilities, but they may be relied on to do their part as conscientiously and credibly. Uh, Mrs. Homestead ran for state senator in 1948. You can see this is her ad for the newspaper here. For state senate in 1948, but unfortunately she was defeated and did not serve political office again. After previously serving in the water, city water department and as Bloomington's clerk treasurer since 1956, Mary Alice Dunlap was appointed by the city council to serve as the mayor of Bloomington after Mayor Tom Lemon's resignation in 1962. Uh, so yay, the first female mayor. Uh, although Mayor Dunlap was not elected by the general public, she was still the first woman to hold the highest public office in the city of Bloomington. Uh, she held this position for two years, uh, 62 to 64, and she ran for mayor in 1964 and un unfortunately lost. She then continued her work um, in, city, in city government, but not um, in elected positions. <clears throat> Mary Alice later recalled in a 1990 interview, quote, my little seed of encouragement really let loose. Women felt like they could be a part of government. Uh, this is a fun um, and interesting article that I uncovered from the Indianapolis Star in 1962 um, detailing the life of Mary Alice Dunlap, the first mayor, and it says the mayor is no gentleman. Uh, but Bloomington's chief executive is most definitely is a lady. She is a housewife, a mother, and a capable administrator. Next is Martha Rayburn. Um, regret regrettably, I don't have much information on Martha Rayburn, who was elected as the first woman t township trustee in Monroe County's history in 1962. Unfortunately, due to poor health, she only served one year and then passed away, unfortunately, the following year in 1964. Mildred Coleman was the first woman to serve on the Monroe County Council after she was appointed to finish her husband, her late husband's term in 1967. She ran for the seat in 1970 and won, um, but she did not run um, the following election in 74. <clears throat> the election of Elizabeth Bridgewaters and her boardmate Delma Packard was the first representation of women on the Monroe County School Corporation Board. Uh, Elizabeth was also the first black woman to serve as president of the board after her re-election in 1972. Mrs. Bridgewaters campaigned for mayor in 1975 and for state representative in 1976, but unfortunately uh, lost both races. Elizabeth also served her community as an AME church minister, a neighborhood advocate, and a citizen historian for Bloomington's black history. Charlotte Bitlow was the first woman to be elected to both Monroe County and City of Bloomington public offices. Charlotte has uh, a long political career serving local residents, including the first woman county commissioner elected in 1980, and then the first woman president of the city council elected in 1971. She advocated for improved zone, zoning laws and the historic preservation of the, count, of the county courthouse. 
In the mid-1980s, Charlotte successfully led the fight against the construction of an incinerator south of Bloomington to clean up PCP contamination and from the Westinghouse Electric Corporation plant and even ran in 1987 against Mayor Tommy Allison to stop the construction of the incinerator. Marilyn Schultz was just 28 years old when she was elected to the newly created um, Indiana State House Representative District 51 um, seat in 1972. She was the first woman elected to represent Monroe County residents at the state level. Despite being new to politics, Marilyn was named to the Ways and Means Committee where she chaired a subcommittee on school finance. Mrs. Schultz served as state representative for 14 years and impacted many Hoosier lives through her tireless work for public education. <coughs> so far, I've only discussed Monroe County and City of Bloomington office holders, but I don't want you to think that I'm focusing, I'm not focusing on Ellisville and Steinsville. There are a handful of women, um, according to the election records, who had unsuccessful campaigns for town elected positions, starting in the late 1940s with Ellisville. But the first successful female candidates were these women between 1975 and 1980. So in Ellettsville, it's Marguerite Christoffel for the Ellettsville Clerk Treasurer, uh, Dorothy Robinson for Ellettsville Ward 3 Trustee, and Elizabeth Fuller for Ellettsville Town Board. And then in Steinsville, it's Thelma Pat Carter for the Steinsville Town Board, Maggie Payton for Steinsville Town Board, and Karen Welch for Steinsville Clerk Treasurer. <clears throat> Tomalia Tommy Allison. Uh, Allison's impact on the city of Bloomington cannot be understated. During her service on city council from 1977 to 1982, and then as the first elected female mayor from 1983 to 1955, Tomalia directed the city's growth policies that continue to impact and improve our community today. She worked to improve city streets, increase the number of fire stations in city parks, and leverage community partnerships to transform the Showers Brothers Furniture Factory into the Showers Plaza, which includes City Hall. Mayor Allison also faced intense backlash for the negotiated settlement of, with Westinghouse Electric Corporation over a proposed incinerator, um, and which was dropped in the final deal. According to her, among her many legacies, Mayor Allison counts the annual Downtown Canopy of Lights celebration that supports downtown businesses and creates lasting memories for Monroe County families. Cy Simpson was the first woman elected to represent District 40 in the State Senate uh, in 1984. Over her two decades of service, Vi was the first woman to lead the State Budget Committee and leader of the Senate Democratic Caucus. She co-wrote legislation that enacted the Indiana Commission for Women in 1996 in order to help Hoosier women reach their full potential. Vi also unsuccessfully ran for governor in 2004 and lieutenant governor in 2012. Although she is no longer in public office, Simpson continues to advocate for Hoosier women and families. In 1985, the Indiana legislature created two new positions in the Monroe County Superior Court to handle the increase in caseload. The following year, Governor Orr appointed Phyllis Kenworthy to fill one of those vacancies, becoming the first woman to serve Monroe County as a judge. Phyllis was a graduate of Indiana University Law School in 1981 and rose to the bench at the young age of 39. Her election to the bench in 1990 was unfortunately unsuccessful, making her the first female judge in Monroe County, but not the first elected female judge. That honor goes to Elizabeth Mann, who was elected in 1992. <clears throat> like Phyllis, she was appointed to the bench in July of 1989 by Governor Bai to the Monroe County Circuit Court seat number four. She then ran in 1992 and 1998, and both campaigns were successful. She served through 2004 and was very active in state and national judicial associations during her time on the bench. <clears throat> Since her appointment as a Monroe County Circuit Court judge in 1995 by Governor Bai, Viola Vi, Talia Farrow, worked every day to help Monroe County children who appeared before her in juvenile court. 
Elected in 1998, Vi was the first black judge to serve until her retirement in 2004. If you'd like to learn more about Vi's career and that of her husband, George, we currently have an exhibit up in our Cook Gallery about the prominent couple, and we invite you to come and see it. Nicole Brown was already serving as Chief, chief uh, Deputy Clerk for, the Monroe, for Monroe County when former Clerk Lisa Robbins resigned in 2016 due to poor health. After receiving 36 of the total 69 votes in the party caucus, Nicole had been elected to serve as the first black female county clerk. She was then re-elected in 2018 by the voters of Monroe County. Brown's goal has always been to increase voter turnout, and in 2020, 63% of the registered voters in Monroe County voted, an increase of 10% from the 2016 general election. Um, <clears throat> Nicole Bolden. After serving as Chief Deputy Clerk for six years, Nicole Bolden was elected as the first black female uh, Bloomington City Clerk in 2016 and the first elected LGBTQ woman of color in the state of Indiana. With her victory, Nicole became, also became the first black woman to be elected to a citywide office. She has a long history of advocating for underrepresented communities and is the co-founder of the Monroe County Black Democratic Caucus. Erica Oliphant. <laughs> Erica Oliphant served as Mon Monroe County as deputy prosecuting attorney for eight years before her election to prosecuting attorney in 2018, making her the first female to be elected to that position in Monroe County. Something that is not noted in the election records are the women who have held uh, positions by appointment only. While it is a great achievement for Erica to be elected uh, as the first female prosecuting attorney, she was not the first. Uh, for, the, for a very brief period in 1994, Kathleen Burns held the position after the prosecutor at the time stepped down. Kathleen, unfortunately, did not win the 1994 election and moved on to become Chief Deputy Prosecutor of Bartholomew County. Uh, Kathleen unfortunately passed away earlier this year, but she will always hold the title of the first in our community, just like Mary Alice Dunlap. <clears throat> and just, pa the, just this past winter, more history was made uh, for women in public office. The Democratic Precinct Committee Caucus for the Monroe County Council District 4 seat was unanimously appointed Jennifer Crossley to complete the term vacated by Eric Spoonmore. Councilwoman Crossley is the first black woman to serve on the council in Monroe County's history, though hopefully not the last. Uh, the election records, can, we can also learn who are the longest, some of the longest serving women in our community. There are many women who have served public office for decades, and I wanted to make sure to recognize their contributions. And while they may not have been the first, they certainly deserve our thanks for their combined 170 years of service to the people of Monroe County. Uh, they include Iris Kiesling, who served nine years on the city council and 19 years as county commissioner, Pat Williams, 18 years as Bloomington city clerk, Regina Moore, 16 years as Bloomington city clerk, Pam Service, 20 years on the city council, Joyce Poling, 16 years as county commissioner and four years as county council member. Marty Hawk, 24, member, 24 years as Monroe County Council member. Judy Sharp, who currently holds the record at 28 years of Monroe County assessor. And Mary Ellen Decoff, 16 years as a Monroe County circuit court judge and she is still currently serving in office. So I guess that number is gonna just keep going up. <clears throat> Uh, this presentation was by no means all-inclusive of the over 141 women who have served in public office in Monroe County. Otherwise, we might be here till next month's History Club meeting. But I hope that this brief presentation and insight into our local election records help you realize just how, how many more glass ceilings need, need to be broken. Like I said earlier, just three months ago, Jennifer Crossley became the first black woman to serve on the Monroe County Council. According to the election records, women's names make up just 15% of the total names listed for elective office. Just 3,725 compared to over 21,000 uh, men's names. 
These numbers are, however, slightly skewed because of the data set, but they are still striking um, all the same. Okay. So this is a, <laughs> a list of all 141 women <laughs> who have been elected to, to public office. <clears throat> Not every woman has the opportunity to be the first to serve in a certain public office and or the one to serve the longest but then by no means does that diminish their service or their accomplishments i would like to take a moment to recognize those in the audience who have um, who have or are currently serving monroe county in elective office so would you please stand thank you very much uh, so while this information is uh, readily available through our online election uh, records and index information, there's still a lot more to go. There's still a lot more work to be done, um, a lot more information that be can be gleaned from these records. So if you have any other questions, I'd be happy to answer them and do what I can. I can also show you a bit, little bit of the index if that's something you would be interested in. Or you can always come to the History Center and we'd be help happy to help you with the, the resource. So thank you very much. Very true, very true. Yeah. Uh, there is no requirement to be sworn in. Best of my knowledge, there never has been. It's over 19 There's no requirement. I couldn't find one, so that's good to know. Yeah. Yes. There's one thing that I thought was okay to talk about the history of the community and the presentation of That's very true. Yes. She served for more terms than the last year. Pat Haley was not included in the presentation and should have been, and that's very true. Pat Haley did was a long-serving member. Very true. Very true. It's probably my my mistake. Yes. <laughs> or that Judy was very good at it. Uh, could have been that way. She's, she's still the assessor. Uh, so her, her number is going to just keep going, keep going up. Um, she holds the record as the longest serving, uh, continuously serving, I guess, um, female um, office holder. And I can't really comment on that if it was unattractive to others. But we could learn um, from the election records if she was op opposed or not. Because you can learn that from the records, um, whether or not she had competition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are you talking about the auditors? Assessor. Of training. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's good to know. Thank you. Yeah. I'm glad to see that you also include eligibility and assignment. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to see a current on that as well. Mm -hmm. For example, mm -hmm. Sandra. Mm -hmm. That's true. That's very true. San Sandra Hatch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very true. Very true. Okay, well, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for coming.